Okay, so I'm finally going to do the uh, the true crime episode I've been saying I was going to do. And to start out with, I'm going to do the case that the first time I heard about it, I was like, whoa, and I was shocked I'd never heard about it before because this is really crazy. So this is about Charlie Brandt, and you've probably also never heard of him, but if you have, yay for you. But this starts in 1971 in Fort Wayne, Indiana, January 3rd. At the age of 13, Charlie walks into the bathroom where his dad's shaving and his mom, who is pregnant, is taking a bath. And he has a pistol. And he shoots his father and his mother. And then he goes into his older sister's room and he aims the gun at her but when he pulls the trigger it clicks and he's out of bullets he shot every bullet at his mom and his dad and so she like grabs him and is wrestling with him and trying to hug him and tells him that she loves him and she says she saw this kind of glazed look leave his eyes because he had this like glazed over look and um so it like leaves his eyes and he said w what did i do and then charlie asks her like he says promise me you'll never leave me and she promises him because she's probably scared but then she runs to the neighbor's house and she starts banging on the neighbor's door but by the time the neighbor enters the door, it's just Charlie standing there, and he just says, I shot my parents. Now, Charlie's dad lived, but his pregnant mom, she didn't make it. So he killed his own mom, and like, thought he'd killed his dad, but only injured his dad. So they send um, Charlie to jail, but then they got to get a grand jury to decide what to do because he's only 13. So it's like they're not, you know, the courts aren't even made for situations like this. So he's in jail for four months till they just finally decide to send him to get psychiatric help at a psychiatric uh, hospital. And, uh, and his dad continues to go back and forth seeing him while he's in this hospital, but he's there for a year. And they really don't know what to do with him. They say they can't really find anything wrong with him that they can, you know, say for sure. So they really don't know what else to do. Do they hold him indefinitely or, you know, just let him go? Because Charlie couldn't even give them a reason why. He just he just says that he was, he, he was doing his homework and just decided to do it. it had no reason. So anyway, he's there a year, and then they let him out. And so Charlie's father takes him, his older sister that he, you know, tried to kill, and his two younger sisters that were too young to even know what was going on that night, and they moved to Florida. And Charlie seems normal in school. He gets good grades and everything, but his sister, she's getting bad grades. It really affected her, like, you know, it, she never really got over it, like, it, you know, she's pretty messed up. Charlie's father remarries, but he never tells his new wife. And then that new wife eventually passes away. He gets married again. He never tells any of his new wives about Charlie's past. And he doesn't tell Charlie's younger uh, sisters about Charlie's past either. So, I mean, he's just keeping it from everybody. And, um... You know, like I said, he done good in school and he became a, a radar specialist, which is kind of weird because I believe Leonard Lake, you know, of the serial killers, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, I believe he was a radar technician, so, mm -hmm, kind of weird there. But um, later, after all that, Charlie asks his brother-in-law, Jim Graves, who's married to his older sister Angela, the one he tried to kill, he asked 
his brother-in-law to hook him up with a woman. And Tim does. He hooks him up with a woman named Terry. Um, and when Charlie meets Terry, I mean, they hit it off. They get real serious real quick, and he ends up marrying Terry in 1984. Um, they never knew for sure if Terry knew about Charlie's past. Jim and Angela both were telling Charlie, you know, somebody needs to tell her she needs to know. Charlie told them that he would tell her, but nobody knows that he did. Like, nobody ever checked with her or anything. They just don't know. So, they just assumed he told her. Um, according to Terry's family, he didn't tell her because they said Terry couldn't keep a secret and she would have definitely, you know, told somebody in the family. Um, when asked about the marriage, anybody that they asked would say they had the best marriage. Like, even in uh, Terry's diary, like, it was all, almost all positive. There was an occasional, like, because it was like a calendar diary and on some days it'd be like she'd just put like weird day on some days she'd put you know charlie stayed out all night but he would say he was out fishing because he was a fisherman so he would say you know he was fishing at night so they even charlie and terry even made each other's uh lunches for work because they said that lunch tasted better somebody you love made it for you so so everything in the marriage seemed perfect. But in 2004, um, I mean, that's almost 20 years of marriage. They're living in Florida, and but they're living in an area that's going to be hit by Hurricane Ivan. And, uh, oh, let me wet my whistle. So, they're living in a part of Florida that's going to be hit by Hurricane Ivan and where they're living <clears throat> they're told they need to evacuate so Charlie boarded up the house but I mean he didn't just board it up like in Night of Living Dead where they're just knocking boards in front of windows there like these were precision cut fit perfectly in the window boarded up so they board their house up and even though Charlie doesn't want to go they go to Terry's niece Michelle's house who lives in Orlando that's further inland where, you know, the hurricane won't get to. And when they get there, Michelle had invited her mom over and some friends over, but they never showed, so it was just um, Terry, Charlie, and Michelle. So the next day, Michelle's friend calls and says, hey, I can come over today and hang out but Michelle says no Charlie and Terry's been drinking and they're arguing so today wouldn't be a good day so she don't come over and at this point the hurricane Ivan it's already hit it's gone so really Charlie and Terry could have went home that day but now Charlie doesn't want to go home so in the first place he didn't want to go now he doesn't want to leave so they stay another night and then in the next day or two, nobody can get a hold of Michelle, which is weird because Michelle's like an executive for the Golf Channel. And, you know, she's really good about returning people's calls or texts and just, you know, staying in contact. So Michelle's mom gets worried and asks a friend of Michelle's to go, you know, check, check everything, make sure everybody's all right over there. So the friend goes to Michelle's house and uses tries to use the key that she's got to get in, but the key won't work. Now later, when the police try that same key, they get in no problem. But you'll see in a minute, it's a good thing her friend didn't get in. But anyway, Michelle's friend still has Michelle's mom on the phone, and she's going around the house checking and not the garage door but this little side door has glass and she can see into the garage and sees charlie hanging dead so she calls the cops now when the cops show up three cops go in the house and this is about to get graphic because this so if you don't want to hear some gory details 
maybe go do something for a minute or two and then come back but I mean it's gonna be pretty graphic the rest of the way so that's a warning but when the three cops three cops go in the house within like 30 40 seconds they come out throwing up and what they find in the house is Charlie's wife Terry is on the couch and only her t-shirt and she's been stabbed seven times in the chest and then they go in Michelle's room and they find Michelle decapitated with her head laying beside her on the bed. Her breasts have been removed and her heart has been cut out and, and her left leg has been cut off. And it seems real obvious to them that Charlie did it but they don't know why. Like the cops are like, why, why did he do this? And you know, why was Michelle so dismembered when it looks like he just kind of killed his wife to get her out of the way so he could do this to Michelle. It just didn't make no sense. And then all around the bedroom, Michelle's bedroom, um, they find that Michelle's bras and panties, like Victoria's Secret bras and panties, have been cut up with a knife. And during the investigation, they find out that Maybe Charlie had a thing for Michelle because he told a co-worker that her nickname was Victoria's Secret. And then they go on his computer later in the investigation and find that he's like looked up like dismembered women and stuff and just some really morbid web searches. So, you know, that's weird. And also on the back of his office door he has one of those diagrams, it's like a, a woman, but it's like cut down the middle. So on one side you have like a normal woman with her skin and everything. And on the other side you got like her bones and her muscles and her veins. Like something a doctor would need. But, you know, he's not a doctor, but yet he has this hanging on his office door. So, I mean, the cops are really like, what is up with this guy? This guy, like, all of a sudden he decides to do all this? It's just really weird. And uh, finally, Angela, the older sister that he tried to shoot as a kid, comes forward, tells the police what Charlie did when he was 13. She also tells the police that she's been scared of Charlie her entire life, wouldn't even run her air conditioner because she wanted to be able to hear Charlie coming if he decided to come after her. So, like, like she's never got over what Charlie did at 13 and never thought that he'd gotten better either, apparently. So finally, the police have something to go on. They're like, okay, so this isn't just something all of a sudden happened. I mean, this he's killed before. Like, he's disturbed, you know? And uh, they, like, going through Charlie's stuff, they even found medical journals that had, like, diagrams of hearts and stuff, so... Like, he'd been reading up on how to do all this, so. Just crazy. So they talked to Jim Graves, the one that hooked him up with Terry, the one that used to be married to his sister Angela. And, uh, when Jim and Angela were getting their divorce, Jim said that Charlie told him that if you wanted to get real revenge, you'd cut out her heart and eat it. And so now that sounds like more than just a, you know, cr something crazy he said about getting broke up with or whatnot. Like, like he probably meant it. But, you know, that still doesn't make sense. Like, what revenge was he getting on Michelle? You know, why did he go after her? Like, was the revenge, did he, like, make a pass at her and she turned him down or something? Like, because that was, like, his niece. It's, I don't know, it just doesn't make any sense, but. But, I mean, the cutting out the heart thing is pretty specific, so. But there's no way to know, because, you know, Charlie's dead and they're dead, so. So, Terry and Michelle's family are outraged that they didn't know anything about, you know, Charlie's past, and they're, they're sure that Terry didn't. But it's discovered that something did kind of happen during Charlie and Terry's marriage. In 1989, there was a woman murdered 
about four blocks from Charlie's house on the Big Pine Key Bridge and her name was Sherry Paricio. She was 38 years old and she lived on like a boat, probably a houseboat. And these fishermen hooked something and they thought it was like garbage or something but it turned out it was her body. And when they pulled her out of the water her head and her heart had been removed. <clears throat> And around this time, according to Jim Graves, Terry told Jim that she went in Charlie's garage or the basement and he had blood all over him. And he said it was from gutting fish and stuff because he'd been fishing is what he said. But Jim claims that Terry told him that she believed Charlie had killed this Sherry Paricio lady. So if that's true, then Charlie probably did tell her about his past for her to suspect that, but, you know, that can't be confirmed in, in, in by any other source. That's just what Jim Gray said she said to him, so who knows? So the police decided to look at all unsolved murders, particular, particularly ones where women have been dismembered, and they find multiple other women in the area that have been decapitated and their hearts cut out. So that's very suspicious. Now another one that they are pretty sure Charlie committed was this woman named Darlene Tollier. And this was in 1995 in Miami. She was found on the side of the road, head and heart removed, his M.O. And she was wrapped in a blanket and then the blanket was wrapped in a tarp. And there was dog hairs on the blanket. And they matched those dog hairs to dog hairs that were in Charlie's truck. Now I'm pretty sure that recently, like in the past few years, they've determined that the forensics on like animal hair and stuff is kind of bunk. But who knows. But it's still kind of, you know, it's his M.O. And I mean, even, if, you know, if they matched, you know. It seems like he did it. So they're pretty sure he committed that one. Um, they attempted to do DNA, but I guess they just didn't have enough like trace DNA on her to match it to him, so they weren't sure. But Charlie, just like he cut his boards perfect for his house, he kept real like specific notes on his gas usage and his mileage. And there was a hundred miles that couldn't be accounted for uh, on the, around the day that Darlene was killed, which would have gave him, you know, plenty of leeway to have gone and done that. So, like I said, they're pretty sure that he done that one. Now, um, they they pull up about twenty six cases that he could be kind of tied to. But because these are cold cases and he's already killed himself, therefore he can't, you know, kill anybody else. You know, they've got current cases they got to work on, so they really haven't had a chance to delve into these deeply. But of all these, including Darlene and Sherry, and some say this even includes Terry and Michelle, I don't know. But there's six cases that they're almost positive he was responsible for. So, so there you go. That is the story of Charlie Brandt. Now this dude has done some horrific, disturbing things. But what really pisses me off about him is after I heard this story, I can't, like there's no other true crime story I've heard that's made me go, what? Like, maybe the Lululemon story, that one's kind of weird. I'll probably do it at some point. But after hearing this case, I'm just like, n no other case has blown me away like this one. Like, I was seriously like, how have I not heard of this one? Um, the first time I heard about it, there's a podcast called Generation Y. You should definitely look that up. I believe it's episode 190. And... Like, after hearing that episode, I've watched documentaries about Charlie Brandt. I was like, Googled and read up on him. 
pretty much all the information available about Charlie Brandt is in that episode of Generation Y podcast. And they just did a great job. That's what got me interested in this case. So if you like this video, definitely go check out that um, episode and and then listen to a bunch of their other episodes. It's a really great podcast. So I wanted to plug them because that's where I first heard of this uh, case. You know, don't want to step on their toes or nothing because, like I said, it's a really great episode. Um, if you like the this episode and me doing the true crime thing, uh, leave me a comment of a case you'd like me to cover in the future, you know? Like, I like doing the ones I like, but I'll do, you know, ones that y'all are interested in. I like learning about them too, so, you know, just comment. Let me know what you want me to do. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment, and share, and please subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Thank you.